Chronicles, Illustrated Man, Fahrenheit 451, screenplay of Moby Dick, some of the finest short stories ever written, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> And uh, I call him a space explorer because he really is a, uh, a man with a fertile imagination to examine and explore areas of creative situations which have never been explored before. So now I'd like to turn it over to Ray Bradbury. Thank you. Can I start it? You've just seen the best part of the film. <laughs> it all goes downhill after that. Actually, the framework of the film is good all the way through. But unfortunately, the individual stories, uh, nobody bothered to read the book. And uh, the uh, producer of the film is a real estate man from New Jersey, who has now gone back to New Jersey, I'm glad to say, and uh, hasn't done anything of very little sense, and I hope he never makes anything. Uh, there is an arrogance among filmmakers that should be, I should warn you about this, because you're gonna have to put up with it if you're gonna stay in the business. They all feel they know more than the writer. So we're all second class citizens. This, um, the illustrated man was sold behind my back by the producer writer who did a script without my permission and went to the studio and to Jack Smite and sold them on the idea of making the film. Then without their telling me that they had a script already finished, they came to me and got the rights and only after they paid out the money, I found out months later that the person responsible was this man named Kreitzik, who uh, produced the film and wrote the script. So this is the sort of dishonesty that occurs in Hollywood quite often. It's a paranoid story, isn't it, huh? Except the paranoia is real. So that's why the, st that's why the film is as bad as it is. Of course, the guy knew nothing about writing. OK, so luckily, you don't have to see the rest of the film. Uh, go see it sometime and look at the framework. The framework works. Uh, now, some of the points I want to make tonight are very important. I don't know what you've been hearing from other writers. I hope I'll say something different. I hope I'll say something exciting and intelligent. I want to warn you about one thing. If you decide to have only careers as screenwriters, you're doomed. Huh? Don't do that. Try to make yourself as open and excitable and fecund with the world as possible. In every other field of literature, if you can possibly learn to write the short story, if you can learn to write decent poetry, if you can learn to write essays, if you can do plays, if you can do novels, for God's sake, do it. Make yourself full and round and complete, because otherwise you are completely vulnerable. Why do I warn you of this? First of all, nobody in the world remembers any of the names of any screenwriter in history. So if that's all you're ever going to be, you'll be forgotten. Who wrote the screenplay for Double Indemnity? You can't tell me. There may be a few specialists here who can tell me, but most of you can't tell me. Even I have forgotten over the years that it was Raymond Chandler, huh? and along with a collaborator. The only uh, screenwriter we can all think of who is well known is Billy Wilder, because he directs his own screenplays. A few other exceptions. But in the long history of time, who wrote the screenplay of Gone with the Wind? You don't know. Who did the screenplay for Rebecca, one of our favorite films? You don't know. Huh? Nobody will ever remember you. And you want to be remembered, don't you? So you get the hell out of here tonight, and you go make yourself rich in every other field. Then you bring that richness back into screenwriting, and you become a better screenwriter. I'm warning you now so you don't have to be a, pay a psychiatrist 20 years from now. <laughs> huh? You're getting the advice cheap, huh? What is it costing you for this advice? And listen to me. Because first of all, you want to be fuller human beings anyway, which means then better screenwriters. But you can't just stick in this field. If something happens to the industry, you go down the drain. There are all kinds of reasons for this. I know a lot of screenwriters, they don't dare leave town. Huh? They make 10 times my income every year, but they're afraid to leave Hollywood. Why? They can be replaced. Huh? When they're gone, someone else will take their job. So they're afraid to go on vacation. They may miss out on something. That's not true for every one of them. There are some people that are so special, they can go where they wish. But that's a small handful. So make yourself needed in many other fields so that you can do the poetry, you can do the short story, you can do the novel, and on occasion say to hell with Hollywood, I'm my own person. I want you to be strong in many ways. 
And then what you learn from George Bernard Shaw and what you learn from Shakespeare, what you learn from Alexander Pope and what you learn from Dylan Thomas, you can come back into the field and make it a better field. So much for warning you on that level. Now, I don't know what your habits are like. I'm going to give you a lot of habits to fill in your life with so that you'll be better screenwriters. Number one, are you madly in love with films? That's the first thing. If you're not, get the hell out of here. I don't want to talk to you. If you're not madly in love with filmmaking, you shouldn't be here, because I'm mad for it. I'd like to have a complete career uh, in screen. I would like to direct someday. No one's given me a chance, but I've seen every damn film ever made I, until about five or six years ago, when they all got so goddamn boring, I gave up on a lot of them. Huh? True. But starting in 1923, when my maniac mother, who was madly in love with, I'm a, first of all, my middle name is Douglas. I was named for Douglas Fairbanks when I was born in 1920. So I come from that sort of background. Uh, I, my first film was The Hunchback of Notre Dame in 1923, at the age of three. I walked strangely for a year after that. <laughs> you know? Phantom of the Opera, all the Lon Chaney films which have influenced my life and my writing. So I am a, I'm an essentially a cinematic writer because my love has been so deep and constant starting as a child. And when I was in my teens, I was seeing as many as 12, 14 films a week. Now I demand that sort of attention from you. If you are not that hungry to see films all the time, you'll never learn. You won't get into your bloodstream and it can't come out. Because that's what all writing is anyway, of just having everything on such a relaxed, intuitive level, you don't have to think about it. You just do it. You sit down and write a screenplay. Because you've seen 10,000 films, and you've studied why you love them. And uh, an adjunct to this is, do you love comic strips? I'm a great collector of comic strips. I recommend it to you. I've been subscribing to Mad Magazine for 30 years. Huh? It won't hurt your screenwriting. It'll improve your sense of humor and uh, your objectivity about yourself. I've put away 40 years of Prince Valiant. I've put away, when I was a child at the age of nine, the first five years of Buck Rogers, the best years. All of the comic strips that are in the Smithsonian are things that I collected when I was nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. So I educated myself to filmmaking through the comic strip. Because if you go back and trace the history of the film and the history of the comic strip, they parallel each other exactly from 1900 on up to our time. And the art of dramatic writing for the screen is developed in the comic strips of 1905, 1908, 1910. When Georges Méliès was making his fantasy science fiction films in France, at that same moment, out cult and other people in the United States were doing surrealist comic strips in the Sunday papers. Go back and take a look at them. Go through the Smithsonian collection, which you can get in paperback in any bookstore, and trace those early years of the comic strip of Buster Brown and the Yellow Kid, and that's a little Nemo. Huh? This is right out of Millier. It's hard, very hard to guess whether Millier is influencing the comic strip or the comic strip is influencing Millier. But you will be better screenwriters if you educate yourself completely in the art of the comic strip which is the shorthand metaphor for the sort of thing you're doing. So aren't I lucky that I fell in love on two or three different levels as a child and said to everyone, get the hell out of the way and let me collect these comic strips, which people made fun of me for doing. Huh? And of course, we must all lead lives where we think one thing, don't we? We are right and everyone else is wrong. Huh? That's the attitude you have to take because people are not going to understand your habits. They're not going to understand your love of movies. They're not going to understand your love of comic strips or your love of poetry or whatever it is, if it's a madness maddened. Huh? So by the time I got out to Hollywood when I was 14, I'd been digesting and eating and devouring all these films. And I arrived in, uh, my dad came out here looking for work in 1934. And I wanted to see famous people. And I had no money for a trolley car or buses or food. And I roller skated out to Paramount Studios one day in the spring of 1934. And standing in front of the studio waiting for me was Mr. W.C. Fields himself. Huh? And I skated up to him. I said, Mr. Fields, can I have your autograph? He signed it. I said, hey, you are, you little son of a bitch. <laughs>
And that was my introduction to Hollywood. <laughs> and I've tried to live up to it ever since. <laughs> so I hung around the studios for years. I was out in front of Columbia and Paramount and Warner Brothers and uh, the Von Dome restaurant, which was known in those days, the Brown Derby, as one of those autograph collectors you're always seeing in front of the studios. You often wonder who they are. Well, here's one of them. Huh? And, but I made it over the wall later, huh? got into the studios because I was mad to be part of the whole thing. And uh, my background is then starting to write short stories when I was 12, writing one short story every week of my life for the last 48 years, huh? or its equivalent in essays or poetry or plays, of just practicing constantly to become better than when I began and along the way hoping that someday someone would ask me to write a, a screenplay. This is roughly my background. Now, enough of that sort of thing. Let me give you some other hints. I want you to try on yourself to make yourself richer people so that it will come out in your screenwriting or your television writing, God forbid. Uh, <laughs> Uh, because I quit. I worked for the Hitchcock show 18, 20 years ago. When Hitchcock quit TV, I quit with him. I've only done two shows in the last 15 years since uh, Hitchcock retired. Because that was a good show, the half hour show and the hour show. They cared about ideas. Huh? Now, every night from now on, starting the night, before you go to bed, I want you to do three things for me. They'll, one of them will take you two minutes, the other will take 10 minutes, and another one will take maybe 15 minutes. I want you to read one poem a night from now on to the end of your life. Huh? I want you to read one essay every night. I don't care from what field, diversify, get the hell all over the place. And one short story. At the end of a thousand days, think of the stuff that will be in your head, huh? My God, the metaphors that will be crammed in there, the ideas from science, from philosophy, from art, from all over the place. I don't want you to, just to be motion picture people. That's dangerous. That's too special. That's too limiting. I want you to be Renaissance people and don't be afraid of the word. There's plenty of time and there's plenty of enthusiasm and plenty of love for each one of you to go out and do this thing. Luckily, I never made it to college. I graduated from LA High School, not talking about this one, but the big ones that stultify and smother and doubt and have their own prejudices and to hell with that, huh? Luckily, I never made it. So what did I do? I started going down to the main library, main LA library when I was 16 or so. And I went in there three or four days a week, took home 10 books at a time, ran up the stacks, went mad in the mystery section, read every mystery novel I could, read all of Moliere, read all the plays of history, read all the poetry of history, read all the essays, went over in philosophy, got a shallow education there, went into art history, the Renaissance. Huh? <laughs> yeah. I can't pretend to explain Kierkegaard and Nietzsche to you. I, they're beyond me, and they still are. But I ran into George Bernard Shaw later, and he sieved and sifted and digested and gave back to me all of their intelligences in a much more metaphorical and intelligent manner, for me anyway. So you see what I want you to do? I want you to be madly in love with ideas on all kinds of levels so that your life will be continually exciting. These ideas are not to be used to beat other people up with, huh? not to one-up people with, but to have fun inside your head late at night when you're going to sleep, when the metaphors begin to happen, when you're taking a nap in the afternoon and the ideas rise to the surface and turn into poems or turn into short stories and you leap up and run to the typewriter. Huh? So starting tonight now, you're going to educate yourself in every single goddamn field in the world because it's fun. Because it's fun, not for any serious reason at all. I hate serious people. I can't stand them. They are boring. Huh? I want you to have a delightful life. And a delightful life is a popcorn machine in your head, huh? With all these kernels going in and beginning to pop after a while. Where, where do metaphors come from? They come from feeding yourself well. But you're not feeding yourselves well enough. I'm guessing at this. That's why you're so boring to other people. <laughs> And you're boring to yourself. There's nothing going on in there. You know, people are asking, where do your ideas come from? Well, they're irresistible. If you stuff enough in there, huh? you begin to see resemblances between philosophies and, and art histories and the murder mystery as compared to Hamlet, which is the greatest murder mystery ever written. Huh? And uh, 
the, the uh, whole history of art, all these things to cram in your head so finally you can't stop working. You don't have to have a schedule. Your passions schedule you to happen, to become yourself. Right? That's where the fun comes. You can hardly wait to get out of bed every morning because the goddamn ideas are all over the place. But you haven't crammed enough in. That's why you don't have ideas. Now you damn well follow what I say tonight and go and read in all these diversified fields and you're going to be exciting to yourself and you may even pick up some extra boy and girlfriends because there'll be something to talk about after you have a lay, huh? Okay. <laughs> Will someone call Harlan Ellison, please? <laughs> <laughs> Tell him to come get me. <laughs> but, okay, now, another piece of advice. See, all this stuff, I'm not telling you what to read, I'm saying to read and pick your own fields all over the place. And the more you pick from diversified parts of the library, the more you want, huh? the hungrier you get. And then you'll make up your own new places to move in some new direction. But. Somerset Maugham gave me the best advice I ever got. I, I picked up his book, The Summing Up, when I was 18 years old, my local library over at Pico and Western. And Maugham gave the, the great advice, go right down the middle of life. huh? Do not sell out for intellectual pretensions over here, because all of your friends say, this is the kind of film to write, this is the kind of book to write, this is the kind of story to write. To hell with that. You can't please your intellectual friends. Up, left, right, in between, up, down, backwards, sideways, inside out. And don't sell out for money. Do not sell out for money. Over here, if you write stories only for money, if you write screenplays only for money, to hell with you. I am not interested in your lives. And you can get out of here tonight and go somewhere else and learn, because I'm not going to help you. Money should come as a reward for work beautifully done, for ideas wonderfully ex executed, for those special kinds of frenetic, fantastic, fun ideas that we can give to the world. Huh? And when you get money for that, that is good money, that is honest money, that is fun money, that is valuable. So if all you want is money out of screenwriting, forget it. You're not going to make it anyway, and I hope you don't. I want people with ideas in their heads. I want films that are exciting and loving of the human spirit and of humankind. That's what it's all about. If you can write screenplays like that, then anything you get along the way, I'm going to bless you. So I'm, I followed mom's advice, and he's never led me wrong. Just by going my own way with my own ideas, my own excitements, getting the stories down, and finishing them and sending them off into the world, and now, on top of that advice, from tonight on, you have to do me another favor. Are you listening? Are you ready for this? All right, from tonight on, shut up. Hmm? Shut up. Stop talking about your screenplays. From tonight on, no more talk ever, 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 ever. Because you're giving your ideas away. You're giving your passion away. You're giving away all the fun. Then you wonder why you don't write things, huh? Because you're blowing it off. You go out for cocktails, you go out for coffee, you say to a friend, oh boy, if I got a great idea, next thing you know, it's gone. And you'll never get it back again. It is the same spirit that inhabits any love affair. If you are going to give of yourself to the totality of the world, forget about having a single love affair with one woman or one man. It cannot be done. So I'm not speaking of virtue here. I'm speaking of attaining a special passion in your writing, that has to be pure and true because you keep it to yourself. And time enough when you finish the screenplay or the short story or the novel or the poem, you can take it to someone and show it to them. Isn't that better? You're damn right it is. So from the night on, you damn well shut up and get your work done. Huh? No more telling ideas to one another because you want the instant gratification. You're playing with yourselves when you do that. And you're going to destroy your ideas and you're going to doom your careers. Have I scared you enough? I hope so. Huh? Stop it. Because I got this advice when I was 21. Henry Kuttner gave it to me. He was my teacher. He was four or five years uh, older than myself. And he came up to me one af afternoon. He said, Ray, shut up. Because I watch you telling your stories to people. And then you go off and sit at the typewriter and nothing happens. Huh? Keep the passion in. Let it ferment. Let it explode. Get it done. 
Write that on your pieces of paper. Paste it on your forehead. Write it backwards so when you shave in the morning, you can look, or if you're just bathing, if you're not shaving, all right, so that you can see the message, shut up. You, you will hear nothing more valuable from any of the other speakers that you will hear in the next few years or that you've heard before me than what I've just said here. This is good practical advice for you. Okay, now, ideas, they're all over the place. And we live in a very exciting time. When people say to me, uh, it's a bad time to live in, I say, no, it's the greatest time in history. And we are the greatest people. We're going through so many revolutions that are so fantastic. You are privileged to be alive at this time. It is the time of all the great ideas. Uh, there is nothing else to write about except all the great ideas. Huh? They're all around us, and they're changing us constantly. I've just reviewed a new book called The uh, Micro Millennium, the history of the computer in the next 20 years. What's going to happen in, uh, in, um, in education, in libraries, in uh, all of the scientific fields because of the computer, and most of it for the good, in linguistics in the next 20 years. It's going to be amazing. You'll be able to carry in this hand a computer, in this hand the entire Encyclopedia Britannica. Anything you want to know, you can hold in two hands. That's exciting to me, to be able to have instant retrieval of certain things that we want at certain times. And we as writers have to be interested in something like that. Now, we're going through a miraculous summer right now, which is proving out what's been going on in screenwriting for the last 11 years. All of the important films in the history of the world, the ones that have made the most money and often have had the most to say to us in some ways, at least one I can think of, two I can think of, perhaps three, are science fiction films. When you name the top 10 films that have made all the money of all time, they're all science fiction. Huh? When, you not, when you name the one series that's made more money than any other series in the history of the world, it's science fiction, James Bond. All the Bond films are science fiction, Have, but no one has called them that, huh? That's what they are, they're science fiction. So here we have uh, The Empire Strikes Back, Star Wars, Close Encounters, which will be back out August 1st, huh? Each of them embodying ideas on some level that are fascinating for the human spirit, for our survival in the universe, starting with 2001, which was a garbled message, but nevertheless it's there, relating us to the universe, huh? Uh, even my film, It Came From Outer Space, on a very primitive level, very primitive film, uh, 27 years ago, had that message at its core, relating ourselves to the universe. Very important thing to do. Now, we're all going to rush off August 1st, aren't we? We're going to go see Close Encounters again. Mm -hmm. And it's going to make another $400 million. So all the films this year that will make the big money are all going to be science fiction films. Even the lesser ones that were not very well made are doing very well. The Black Hole is not a well-made film. In fact, it's pretty boring, right? But the very fact that it has architectures that please us, we go for the architectures, don't we? We go for the special effects. We want more than that, and we get more than that in a film like The Empire Strikes Back or Close Encounters. So we're all going to go off and see these things again. So now, the reason I bring this all up is because you are of this generation, you are looking for ideas, and the more you can work with the science fictional metaphor, the more you can explain us to ourselves in terms that are exciting for the modern mind. There is no major problem that faces us right now that is not science fictional in character and science fact in its final release into the world. All the important ideas that surround us were once impossible dreams. Huh? Just a few years ago, 40 years ago, at atomic power didn't exist. And we didn't dream a time would come when atomic power would change the face of war and change the face of, face of politics. So that instead of war being an extension of politics, now we are forced into a position where politics is an extension of politics. Huh? We've had to give up the big wars. We have the small ones, but we've had to give up the big ones because the destruction is so total and the profit is so small. That's pure science fiction. If I'd written about that 40 years ago, you would have said, no way. Huh? Uh, the whole thing of, uh, uh, when you think of the pill, which didn't exist in the world 25 years ago, would you have predicted that a day would come when a girl in Schenectady would swallow a pill and the Bernini's pillars in front of the Vatican would crumble and fall? Huh? Well, that's what's happened, huh? 
We've seen the whole Catholic Church shaken by all these science fictional concepts of the last 10 or 15 years. And we have the rush to liberalize our concepts relative to the new invention. Huh? Now, let me name the greatest musical film ever made, which is also a science fiction film. I wonder if you can guess which one it is. The name of the film is Singing in the Rain. Huh? My all-time favorite, I don't know if it is yours, but just you could main, name maybe one or two other musicals. But for me, it is the best single musical ever made, and it's pure science fiction. Have you ever thought of it in those terms? No, you haven't. You heard it here tonight for the first time. <laughs> OK, why is it science fiction? Because it tells the story of the impact of a technology on an aesthetic. Huh? If I'd been born in 1900 and written a novel in 1920 predicting that someday silent motion pictures would have a voice that would enunciate and change the world and revolutionize acting and throw thousands of people out of work, you would have laughed at me and said, come on, that's never going to happen. Films are going to remain silent forever, and which was what was predicted finally in 1925. Sound is a flash in the pan. It'll be here and gone like three-dimensional glasses in a few months. And of course, that's not the way it turned out. So go back and look at Singing in the Rain again. The story of Singing in the Rain is pure science fiction becoming science fact. And every scene that plays, all the humor, all the musical numbers play off the science fictional concept. So you see, science fiction has nothing to do with the future at all. It has to do with the birthing of ideas amongst us at this very time. And these births are going on, and we forget to notice them because we're involved in the process. Huh? The history of science fiction, the history of human ideas, goes back to the cave. When cavemen were existing in caves 100,000 years or so ago, they were writing science fiction. How did they do it? And they drew pictures on walls. They drew a picture of a saber tooth because they wanted to knock his goddamn teeth out and kill him because he was a danger. They drew pictures of hairy mammoths that they wanted to kill and eat, but they couldn't. They drew pictures of fire that they couldn't bring into the cave. It was the science fictional dream. How do we invent the sciences to bring in the fire, to kill the mammoth, to destroy the saber tooth? And they found scientific ways of primitive scientific ways of doing this and the science fiction on the caves became science fact. That's the history of ideas. You come up through time, to the time of Napoleon. Napoleon needed a way of curing the world of botulism. He set up a fund in Paris in, 18, in 1798, asking some science fictional dreamer to invent the tin can. And a young man outside of Paris who had the dream, invented the tin can that's come down to us, and millions of lives have been saved since. Napoleon is responsible for that science fiction dream. Daguerre comes along and says, I have a dream of trapping time. The problem of mankind is what? Of losing information all the time. We, are, we wish to be the reliquaries of all time. We wish to save all the information we can so that we can digest it and use it and grow and survive and prevail. Right? So Daguerre gives us a whole new way of saving time. Up until Daguerre's time, you had only architecture, which is a way of preserving a truth, pictures, which don't last very long, books, which are very fragile, and the teller of tales. Huh? The teller of tales that moves amongst us, like my book people at the end of Fahrenheit 451, and speaks the truths to remind ourselves of our long history. But we need more ways of doing that. So Daguerre invents photography. Edison then says, I will take that same truth and I will move it. And he invents cinematography. And then along comes sound. And in our time, we are the reliquaries of all time. I was going through the Vatican Museum two years ago and looking at the bones of the saints made up in crystal goblets with golden lids. Huh? They used to keep the bones of saints, the relics of the past to remind themselves of these great saints. But we are better than that. We are so fantastic because we can save it all. We have invented this thing that's pointing at me right now, and all the video cassette machines and all the uh, recording devices that are going to go into space, keeping records of all of us on, on records, not on tapes anymore, not on film. And we can put away everything we need to survive through the next 10 million years. We can truly become the reliquaries of all the great informations we need to survive by. That's why this time is exciting. 
It's the best time in the history of the world to be alive. And you can be part of it with all these ideas, helping build this future that's um, immediately in front of us with your metaphors, with your metaphors, with your exciting ideas. Huh? Don't let anyone doom you. Huh? I can't stand it. I don't like dooming people. I don't believe it anyway. I'm an optimist. And what does that mean? I'm going to enable you to behave optimally. That's all it means. No happy endings, huh? no guaranteed futures. I'm going to help you to behave optimally, up to the level of your genetic talent. That's what it should mean, giving yourself a chance to behave optimally within a society. And your society is totally free and open with these ideas for you to behave within it. So it's a great time to be alive in. And uh, let's see if there are any final points. My god, I really have gone on. OK. But I felt I wanted you to know me. I want you to know, know my ideas and my enthusiasm, which remains unbounded because of the fun that I have playing in the fields and the meadows of science with these ideas. I want that for you, too. Uh, maybe very briefly, Moby Dick. Very briefly, Moby Dick. When I was in my 20s, people sent me letters and said, when are you going to write a screenplay? And I've always known what my dreams were, what I wanted to be. And I wrote back to all my friends and I said, I will write my first screenplay when John Huston asks me. Hmm? So I knew who I wanted to work for because I saw Maltese Falcon 12 times the first year it came out when I was 20 or 21. And Sierra Madre when it came out 20 times and all the other films. And uh, John Huston was at a at a screening one night when I was 29 years old, and he sat in the row right behind me. And I wanted to leap around and grab his hand and say, my God, I love you and I love your films, and I want to work for you so badly I can taste it. But I thought I'd scare him off if I did that, <laughs> and I'm sure I would have. So I held myself off and I said, Ray, don't say anything. Just keep your peace, and when you have proof of your love, books to offer, stories to offer, to prove your love, take them to him, give them as a gift, and run away. So on St. Valentine's Night, 1951, I'd published three books, Dark Carnival, Martian Chronicles, Illustrated Man, none of which had sold worth anything, 7,000 copies apiece. Hmm. And uh, I called my agent, and I said, now I want to meet Mr. Houston. And on St. Valentine's Night, 1951, a great night to start a love affair, I met John Houston. I put the books on the table. I said, someday, if you love these as much as I love you, hire me. He went off to Africa to make the African Queen. He wrote me a month later saying, yes, someday we'll work together. I've read the stories, and they're good. Didn't see him again for three years, two and a half years. Came back to uh, Los Angeles in August 1953, called me on the phone, brought me up to the Beverly Hills Hotel, put a drink in my hand, said, Ray, what are you doing right now? I said, nothing in particular. I've just finished a new book, Fahrenheit 451. He says, uh, what are you doing in the next six months? I said, nothing. He says, how would you like to come live in Ireland and, and write the screenplay of Moby Dick? <laughs> and I said, gee, I don't know. I, I've, never been able to, I've never been able to read the damn thing. So he said, well, kid, why don't you go home and read as much as you can tonight and, and, and come back at, at lunch tomorrow? <laughs> so I went home and I said to my wife, pray for me, because yeah, I've got to read as much of this book as I can tonight. And I hope I love it, because I cannot, I cannot take work I do not love. And if that, that's part of the lesson here tonight, please try not to do things you don't love for the rest of your life. Here and there, you may have to survive. There may be illness in your family. There may be such utter poverty that you have to, and in which case you're, you're excused. Because illness, illness and poverty, really, you, you have to have food and you've got to survive. But beyond that, please, try to do things that are loving. So I ran off and took a big jump into the middle of the book. And I, I didn't start reading at the be beginning. That that's a hell of a way to read any book. You shouldn't do that. Not to fall in love. Just pile through it. Any old place. I opened it at three, three different places. And first I open it 
at a section where Melville describes the whiteness of the whale, the, the terrors of midnight panics, the subterranean creatures that rise up from the uh, surfaces below, blind because they have no need for seeing. Then I turned back to another section, and I found that place where Melville describes the great spirit spout of the whale, of Moby Dick, somehow put to sea at 3 a.m. of the soul's midnight, sprinkling the deeps with great, great jets. Then I turned back to the back and I found that section where Ahab stands at the rail and says, it's a mild, mild day and a mild looking sky and the wind smells as if it blows from the shadow of the Andes where the mowers have lain down with their scythes. And I turned back to the beginning and I read, call me Ishmael and I was in love. And I went back the next day, I read as much as I could that night and I went back to lunch the next day to Houston. I said, yes, I'm 33. I think I'm ready to read the book. <laughs> I think I can do the job. I smell the blood of Shakespeare here. And of course, Shakespeare was the inspirer of the novel. And I smell the Bible here, and I'd been raised on the Bible. So I had two, two things in my favor, uh, an already full education in Shakespeare, full education in the Bible. And Melville was my next lesson. Well, I got over to Ireland, and my God, it was difficult. It took six months of reading some sections 100 times over, 40 times over, 80 times over, until a wonderful thing happened. If you're, let this be a lesson to you. If you're going to be adapting other people's work, you must be this intense and this deep and this smothered and this drowned in the work that you must spend the better part of a year, if possible, getting the work into your blood completely till you don't have to think about it anymore. Because thinking is the enemy of creativity. Thinking is the enemy of creativity. Doing is everything. But you can't do unless you know on some intuitive level. So you get that damn book, you cram it in there, and you get it all hidden away in your blood. And then one morning in London, I got out of bed, and I walked over to a mirror, and I pointed at myself, and I said, I am Herman Melville. <laughs> and by God, I was. And in that one single day, I rewrote the last 40 pages of the script in a single day. And all the metaphors came together. Everything fell into place. Next time you see the film on the screen or on the TV, you look at that last 35 or 40 minutes. All that beautiful stuff came out in a single day because the ghost of Melville, the essence of the book, was finally in there. I didn't have to think about it. I could vomit it out huh? and get it on paper and love it in the doing. Huh? That's what screenwriting is about. If you're going to go around thinking about it all the time, you'll never do. Huh? Very important. So what I'm setting you up for in every field is doing, 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 and not thinking. Time to do your thinking after the act. Doing is being. Huh? Doing is being. There's a message in The Empire Strikes Back for all of you. If you haven't seen it, go see it. If you've seen it once, go see it twice because it makes the film very especially beautiful for me. It's where the Zen master is teaching Luke Sky master, uh, Skywalker. And Luke at one point says, I don't believe it. And the Zen master turns on him and says, and that's why you fail. Huh? There's no such thing as trying. There's only doing. So get the concept of trying out of your head. Get the concept of thinking out of your head. Just do, write every day. Every day from now on. I insist, or you'll never made it. make it. It must be madness. It must be a passion with you. You must be so enthused with your screenwriting that it fills your life along with all the other things I want you to do at the same time. You think you don't have time for them? Hell. As soon as your passion grows, you got all the time in the world. You don't have time now because you're bored, as we were saying earlier. You haven't found ways of expressing your passion in all these various fields. Plenty of time when a thing is over to analyze it and find out what's missing. And when you find out what's missing, then you go back in and passionately rape the thing again. Huh? Attack it passionately again, or the flesh won't be the same. So if there's a missing scene or a missing beat in a screenplay, you think about it, and then you go do it passionately and you'll have the same texture through the whole thing. Otherwise, you'll have bits and pieces of passion and bits and pieces of intellectuality. Don't worry about your brain not showing. It'll show. Huh? You can't help it if you have a high IQ. It's going to come out in your passion. It's going to be locked into these things I'm telling you about. So don't worry that we're going to miss out on the fact you're the biggest brain that ever was born in the world. It's going to show. It's going to show if you got the brain. 
if you got the ideas. Okay, time for questions. You thought I'd never quit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you raised a lot of questions, one of which I would like to ask. On the last 35 pages or 40 pages of Moby Dick, what had you done in terms of approaching the screenplay in your first draft, and then how did you manage to change that, and what did you do to accent and articulate the visual dynamics when you were, in a sense, uh, Herman Melville? What you do finally is through all this reading and rereading, trust your subconscious to come up with the answers. I didn't do anything. My subconscious did it all. So what you're trying to do, and that's why I want you to read poetry so much, you see, uh, I don't think an article has ever been done on the function of poetry in screenwriting. I think it's so important. The more poetry you can read in the next few years, the better your screenwriting is gonna get. Of the various art forms, there are only two that are entirely identical as far as I'm concerned, and that's poetry and filmmaking. So the art of the metaphor, the art of compacting things into scenes that are memorable without words most, most of the time, or gestures which are metaphorical. And I'm not being fancy at all. It's just that haiku can teach us ways of looking at things which are very compact, which remain in our minds for the rest of our lives. So that if you read lots and lots of poetry, the ability of the intuitive self, the hidden mind, to hand you metaphors, to eliminate pages of dialogue, that's what you want to be able to do, isn't it, huh? Because we don't want screenplays that talk. Only on occasion do we want talking screenplays. The, the comedy of manners, there's a certain kind of a political drama uh, where it works. But nevertheless, the movies that we really love are those that know how to use camera and metaphor and say things. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples here. Uh, but before I do, go back to the Moby Dick thing. Uh, out, of the, out of my subconscious, I plucked things from the back of the novel, things from the front, things from the middle, put them all together, lined them up as a single metaphor. If next time you see the film, the becomement scene, where the man falls overboard, and as soon as he hits the water, the calm begins. That is not in the novel. I put the two metaphors together. The coin on the mast is not connected in to these other two events. The throwing of the bones by Queequeg is a separate chapter, where Queequeg decides to sit down and die is not connected to the coin on the mast or the man falling overboard or the becalmment. His having his own coffin built is separate from all these things. I then, in this one single day, put all these separate elements together in one big scene when the man falls overboard. I said, that's a good, good signal for the sea to calm because Moby Dick has taken his first victim. They've been warned to stay away from his waters. Then, within the calm, the throwing of the bones, Queequeg predicts his own death. He sits down and starts to die. In the middle of all this, in the novel, you never find out why Queequeg comes out of his death trance. Huh? Go back and try and find it. And if you find it, tell me. I was never able to find it. So my reasoning within the metaphor was there's only one thing that can call Queequeg out of his trance, and that is the possible death of his beloved friend, huh? Ishmael. So within that scene, Ishmael's life is threatened by a sailor with a knife, and in the middle of the sailor trying to kill Ishmael, Queequeg comes out of his death trance and grabs the sailor and tries to kill him, at which moment Moby Dick arrives. I've set the scene for the arrival of Moby Dick, the first time you see him. So the whole thing works, it all has a flow, but if you read it in the novel, all these things are separated out in other chapters and have nothing to do with each other. So by reading the whole book 40 or 50 times and getting it into my subconscious, then my subconscious gave me the gift of the metaphors. Then, at the very end of the novel, uh, there's a character named Fidala, who's a boar. And when I arrived in Ireland, I said to Houston, the first thing we do, do we go to the edge of the ship and throw Fidala overboard? He says, be my guest. Because he's the extra mystical straw that breaks the whale's back. Huh? And he's a boar, terrible boar. So I said to myself, now wait a minute. 
If Moby Dick is everything we say he is, metaphorically, then Moby Dick should take Ahab down. And instead of Fadala coming up on the side of Moby Dick, Ahab should come up. And it's Ahab who gestures the men with his dead arm, huh? To follow into the deeps. And God, am I proud of that, huh? It's not my conscious mind that thought that, it's my intuitive mind gave me that gift. So when you see the film, and Ahab is already dead, and the monster rises up, and the movement of the whale causes the arm to gesture, and all the men follow to their deaths. Well, that's not, that's not in the book anywhere. It's a very haunting scene. Yeah. It just stays with So uh, that's why I want you to read more poetry, and I want this intensive thing with you where you get your subconscious churning out the metaphors for you. Very nice. Uh, we have a question that uh, deals with that to a certain degree. Uh, do you find any difficulty in translating your work to the visual medium? A short story, a novel, a play, uh, for example, The Martian Chronicles? Well, of course, when I did The Martian Chronicles for the stage, uh, what I do is float over that novel just as I floated over Moby Dick. You don't want everything word for word or you're going to risk boring everyone. You want the essence. And uh, a year ago, I d adapted Fahrenheit 451 for the stage here in Los Angeles. The play is much better than the film, and in some ways better than the book. Why? Because I got all the characters together, and I said, look, I trust you. I haven't seen you in 27 years. What's new? Huh? <laughs> uh -huh. And each character stood up and said, well, gee, since last we met at the typewriter, this has happened to me, and I've grown. I know myself better. And the fire chief was the one that really astounded me, though. He said, my God, you want to know why I burn books? It's, it's nowhere in the novel. Huh? But now I know why I burn them, because he was a great lover of books. Huh? He takes Montag in the play. This is not in the novel. He takes Montag to his apartment. And when he gets Montag in there, they look around, and there are thousands of books on the wall. And Montag says, my God, you're, you're the fire chief. These are your books? Well, it's against the law. And he says, Montag, it's all right to have the books as long as you never read them. <laughs> I never read them. They are dust on the shelves. They are ignored. They are, they are dying because I turned my back on them. And finally, Montag says, my God, you must have, he says, what? He says, you must have loved them very much once on a day. He says, yes, yes. Uh, oh, God, I was madness mad, and I climbed the stacks. I, I ate them like lettuce. I stuffed them in my ears. I opened my eyes and crammed them in. Books were my life, my being. And then a Montag says, and what happened? He says, well, the same, the usual. You know, the, the mother that died from a long illness, the father with a short suicide, the loves that didn't work out, the sex that wasn't right, the deaths of friends, the failure of uh, dreams, huh? all these things. And finally, you turn and you become so bitter with life that you take it out on the books that were supposed to save you, huh? because that's supposed to be the answer, isn't it? And all of us tend to put our faith too much in any one thing in life. It's, it's good to diversify, have varieties of loves, and know that uh, there are times when nothing can save us from certain things. Only, uh, we can only be saved up to a point. And if we're lucky, our genetics do the rest of the saving. In our bad love affairs, in our marriages, in our friendships, in the deaths of friends, and the moving into old age and the illnesses that assail us. Uh, uh, books beyond a certain point can't help. I wish I could say they do, but they can't. So this was fascinating to trust my character when I write a stage play to write the scenes for me. And in the screenplay, the same way. When I adapt things, I'm going to be working on two things as uh, screenplays now. And I look at the story very briefly and then put it away forever. And then just start new and let the characters recreate themselves and, and grow. Otherwise, it's a bore. You don't want to be boring to yourself. You want to have a whole new experience with an old idea. And the only way to do it is forget the original. And, and if anything's missing later, you can always take it and put it back in if it's that essential. Okay. Fine. Um, I have a question here. What secret do you use to get started writing and keep you once you've started? <laughs> I think we've already handled that, yeah. haven't we? On a daily basis, yeah. for example. Yeah. Well, today, uh, I, I try to start every day by writing a poem and uh, just letting it come. 
and I've been writing poetry since I was a child, and it only started to get good, oh, about 12 years ago. The editors of Pro Football Magazine called me, and they wanted me to write an article on football. I said, thanks a lot. I love the game, but I don't know what to say. They said, well, we'll offer you umpty ump thousand dollars. I said, no, 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 I don't work that way. I've got to know what I want to uh, feel. And I don't feel anything right now. You're talking to me, but I can't do it. I hung up, I thanked him. I hung up and I sat at the typewriter. And I was thinking about the football games I saw in my last year at high school. My brother played professional football here with the LA Bulldogs 37 years ago. And my dad and I would go down to Wrigley Field and my brother would run out and we were so proud and we'd ride home with him and he, sw he smelled wonderful. Football, football players smell wonderful. Did you know that? Well, they do. And because they smell of glory and passion and triumph and defeat and all these things. So I started putting this, all this in a poem. And when I finished it, I said, what in hell do I do with it? Here's this eight-page poem. Do I send it to Pro Football Magazine? I said, well, what the hell went out on a hunch? But then my next thought was, God, can you imagine? A month from now, <laughs> people are sitting in the stadium across the country, and this guy says, hey, George, look, uh, look here in the program, and there's a poem. Shall we read it? Uh, <laughs> like hell, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, by God, I got the fastest acceptance in my life by playing the hunch. I got a check for $400, which was a lot of money for a poem. The next day, the next day, the poem already set in type, but the most important thing the editor said was, I'm sending a copy of your poem to my father. I said, my God, if you can get an American son to send a poem to his father, it's the end of the world, huh? <laughs> When's the last time you sent your pa a poem, huh? <laughs> well, and what a shame. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Why not, huh? So that encouraged me to write more poetry, and every day I just sit down, word associate, and get the metaphors going. And uh, uh, two months ago, I have a new book of poetry coming out uh, uh, this summer. And my editor called me and says, we have no title for your book. Do you want to use one of the uh, poem titles? I looked at all the titles. I said, no, they're not, they're not good enough. I said, let me make up a title and call you back. So 10 minutes later, I call him back, and I said, I got a title. I think it's good. He says, oh, what is it? He's, I said, The Attic Where the Meadow Greens. Huh? The Attic Where the Meadow Greens. Geez, that's interesting. What does it mean, though? <laughs> I didn't know what it meant, but it sounded good. I says, now, hold everything. I'll go write the poem. <laughs> so I went to the typewriter. I said, well, it's an attic, which obviously has a greenhouse in it. Huh? There's a meadow up there where my grandfather putters, and we play croquet in the summer. And by God, the poem wrote itself in five minutes. And you go up there, and you play croquet, and you plant flowers. And the thunderstorms are beating on the windows of this wonderful attic with a greenhouse in it. And when your grandfather dies, you bury him up in the attic, huh? And you, you, you can hear him up there on late summer nights playing croquet long after he's dead. <laughs> well, there you go. There's your metaphor, huh? So you see, I'm an avid writer of poetry, and I'm an avid a writer in every field, and that comes over into my, into my screenwriting. Okay? All right. What was the longest period of time that it took you to develop and complete an idea for a story from its original inception? They come, everything has to be fast. If you slow down, you begin to lie, you make up reasons for not doing things, you intellectualize, you try to please friends and to hell with them, you try to pol please political groups and screw them, huh? Uh-uh. Fastness is everything. Fastness is creativity. The slower you go, the worse it becomes. This is a, a general statement. It may not be true for 2% of you here. There are slow people in the world, but most of the great and good and fine writers are fast writers, and they write a lot. And out of quantity comes quality. If you write too little, you don't learn, and you don't release the intuition. That's what we're after here. By writing quickly, you free the intuitive self to come to the surface and speak its truths. Make a list of the 10 things you hate most and write about them. Make a list of the 10 things you love most and write about them. You can't go wrong, huh? Who do you want to kill tonight? Each have someone you want to kill, huh? Some bully that picked on you when you were 10, 11, 12. Whether you're male or female, there's always someone in all of our backgrounds. Men mostly act these things out in their fictions and in their lives, we are the murderers of the sexes. And, uh, but nevertheless, make the list and go back and kill that bully that you still remember from when you were 
10, 11, 12. That's the stuff you work with at the start of your career. I did a story for Esquire a few years ago in which I went back at the age of 45 to my hometown and found the son of a bitch that had beat up on me when I was 10 <laughs> and, and symbolically killed him, didn't really kill him, because time had already killed him when I arrived there. But it made for a fine story, huh? But again, word association, go into the typewriter every morning before you go to sleep at night, put a piece of paper in the typewriter, write any gibberish that comes in your mind and leave it there overnight. Think about it in the middle of the night, get out of bed in the morning, no answering of phones, no looking from now on, no reading of newspapers, no contacts with anyone else, go directly to the typewriter and write anything that comes into your head, I don't care what it is, and keep at it. Keep writing lines and lines and lines and suddenly you'll get ideas. Bring people on to discuss a metaphor. Uh, make lists of nouns and then say, okay, let's bring people on in to talk about the nouns. Or attic, the attic, the basement, uh, the night, the dark, the closet, the frog, the wind. I made lists like that 38 years ago and wrote short stories about each one. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, huh? Why do I put down the night? Well, I remembered suddenly, I started typing. Bring characters on to act it out. It's nighttime. And you're an eight-year-old kid, and you go to the edge of the ravine with your mother, and suddenly, for the first time, you feel that the night could come up out of the ravine and, and get you, and nothing could stop it. Huh? Your mother's not strong enough, or your father, or any of us. And the night can finally get all of us. That's a moment of revelation, isn't it? Huh? So you write about it, and then you suddenly remember the first day you discovered you were alive. Write about that. Huh? Different for every one of you in a different way. I was 10 or 11. When I looked at the hair on the back of my wrist one day and the wind was blowing, and I said, Jesus God, I'm inside here. Huh? No, one, no one told me I was in here, and I'm alive. It was glorious, you know? This uh, kind of wonderful hysteria, this passionate recognition of the fact that we're trapped in this fabulous castle and looking out through the holes, and the elation that comes from knowing how special we are and looking at your hands and saying, my God, I'll write that, huh? Have you written it? Have you thought about it? That's the stuff. And then the day you discover you can die for the first time. You're 13 or 14. You're sitting in a movie, and the cowboys are killing each other on the screen, and it suddenly hits you. My God, that could happen to me. It will happen to me someday. What do I do? How do I escape? I know what I'll do. I'll kill myself. <laughs> but that doesn't work, does it? Yeah, you're playing right into the hands of death. So what do you do? You stick around and make do, huh? You stick around and you make do with the two revelations, the revelation of light and the revelation of darkness and all the stuff between, okay? It reminds me of a short story you wrote which has just stuck with me for years from Golden Apples of the Sun called The Crowd. The story of the go. crowd who follows someone around. It's just beautiful. That's right. Uh, I was down by the graveyard on Washington Street near Vermont when I was 14. A car hit a telephone pole going 60 miles an hour. I ran across the street in time to watch three people die. One woman had been flung from the car and hit a fire hydrant face on at 50 miles an hour. I'd never seen anything like it. And uh, the other people were just shattered. And the, there were eight people in the car. A lot of them died the next day or within the hour. And I went home staggered, you know, just absolutely staggered and holding on to fences to make it home. And of course, I never got over it. I still have it when I think of it. And when I was 21 or 22, put that experience in this story. For the most. I think everything. First of all, the architectural thing. We, we love the architectures. We're interested in building the future on many levels. And the black hole, if you can sit through most of it, <laughs> pays off toward the end because the architecture is so gorgeous. And there are five or six minutes there where you have that wonderful delight for the eye, which is also true in all of our favorite science fiction films, including Close Encounters and Star Trek. Incidentally, Star Trek is really quite a, a good film, but Paramount is, re is responsible for the shape it's in right now. It was released without being cut. Robert Wise was never allowed to cut it. Mr. Roddenberry was never allowed to cut it. It was shoved into the theaters the morning after the score was finished. So there was never a chance. The film needs 20 minutes cut out of it, and it'll be a very nice film indeed. So before you criticize that picture, remember that the studio did it, and not uh, Robert Wise. Yes. <laughs>